Larissa Valushina, a Ukrainian journalist from Kiev, gave an interview to the channel Newsader on the 11th of October 2023. Alexander. Hello, Larissa. Larissa, hi, Sasha. Alexander, let's try to compare events in Israel and Ukraine because the analogies are simply obvious, but precisely which ones? Some things are painfully familiar. I'm asking this question because what Israel is grappling with in the last few days, Ukraine has been experiencing for the last 20 months. Larissa, I agree that there are many similarities. Everybody is paying attention to the atrocities, to the war that is being conducted not against the state and the military, but first and foremost against peaceful population and with such demonstrative cruelty. But I would rather begin from the manner in which breakthrough was conducted. It looked very familiar to me. It was very similar to the way Crimea was captured. And it's very reminiscent of the technology used in Tallinn when the fighters, as we understood, the proxy fighters sent by Russia, staged unrest in Tallinn using the occasion of the transfer of a monument to the soldier. It was very similar to the way the conquest of Kiev was planned. What I mean is the Russian Federation's invasion method is based on using the external aggression with the domestic factor. As we know, that the domestic turmoil looks like an unrest of the ordinary people, but they are accompanied with cyber attacks. For instance, there is a good research carried out by NATO in the Baltic countries. In my understanding, that includes three countries. They investigate the behavior of Russia, and not only of Russia, as well as strategies, since quite a while ago. And in 2014-15, they issued a report which drew parallels between telling attacks of Russia on Tbilisi, Georgia, and the seizure of the Crimea. According to their data, the same technology was used. Understandably, it was hard to raise unrest against Saakashvili in Georgia, taking into account that Western leaders were present at the Liberty Square and leaders of many countries, including the Ukrainian president Yushchenko. And the weird story was made up, with some people tired of the bad Georgian government, which attacked Tsienvali. So this kind of tools were used in Tallinn too. What really happened then was that under the disguise of local residents, some of them indeed are local recruits, like the so-called self-defense of the Crimea and self-defense of Donbass, while such formations were created since the Maidan event by the local authorities. But at the core of these formations are the Russian Secret Service officers. They know very well what they're doing, what they're seizing, how they lead, while they are surrounded by crazy local people, some of them armed as it was in Donbass. The police cannot cope with such situations, even if it wished to, because police are not trained to counteract the subversive elements, whose numbers are about a hundred while thousands around them are local marginalized groups. And army cannot counteract the marginalized groups and secret service officers because they are, there are too many of them. We witnessed how this setup was used three times. Apparently, a similar thing was planned during the wide-scale invasion of Israel. We know that in Kiev it was planned to stage a turmoil with the participation of five to 10,000 Kievan residents, the so-called, pursuant to the landing of the Russian army in Gostomel, and simultaneously there would start protests. What we saw in Israel was a very similar technology. While well-trained 
military were used, cyber attacks took place, which incapacitated the Israeli security and army, and at the same time, there were crowds of marginalized groups armed with machine guns who simply looted, raped, and killed. This particular technology is Russian, and it is well-researched. It is obvious that in order to plan and conduct such an operation, they needed time. They couldn't do it in a week or a month. The operation was synchronized and well-planned. Some non-standard elements were used, such as paraglides and many other things. So when I saw it, I realized that it was a Russian technology. Without doubt, Russia was involved in training, planning, and in cyber attacks, and importantly, drones were used too. According to the Israeli Security Service, approximately 10% of drones in the field hit the target. It all depends on the mastery of the drone pilots. Today, there are 10,000 drone pilots in Ukraine. They are the elite military. It is understandable because people who are capable of directing a tiny drone with the ammunition attached to it, leading to the target, avoiding interception, maneuvering at a speed of 200 km per hour, all that requires persons with fast reaction. What we saw in Israel was that military drones were targeting their cover tanks. They knew what they were doing. This is how Ukrainian drone pilots work, too. This is not a coincidence. It is not just someone who learned to drive, plus combat experience. And at the same time, we see strange people who seize a tank, jump on it, take pictures with their machine guns, and then abandon them and leave them because they can't start them. Thus, we see that we are shown proxy. People breaking through the holes, running around Israel and robbing, killing, raping. And simultaneously, a very high precision work is being done, which requires months of training and planning. This is very interesting. And of course, the killings are also the Russian technology. The manner in which they are performed, demonstrative atrocities, videos which we saw which are also used as video evidence in the UN investigation. Recently UN Committee on Torture announced that they identified a photo, a video, including the one featuring a killing of a Ukrainian military who said glory to Ukraine and beheading of prisoners of war. The authenticity of the videos was established, but those videos were disseminated by Russia. Let's reiterate. Russia started the war with the demonstration of its atrocities. Remember, this is Russian battleship. Surrender is the Ukrainian military's answer. The Russian battleship, go fuck yourself. And what was the Russian response to it? They leveled that little snake island and disseminated the video on the internet. They did not realize that when they disseminated the video of the communication between the Moscow warship commander and the Ukrainian border security, followed by a complete annihilation of the snake island, it would work against them, against Russia. Russian warship with three dots phrase became a worldwide meme. We even saw Steven Spielberg, I believe other celebrities, Pink Floyd wearing t-shirts with the same phrase. Russians didn't know about the consequences. The purpose of the dissemination of that video was to show the deliberate, demonstrative cruelty. And it is apparent that when the videos and photos of shootings in Israel by the militants appeared, I wouldn't call them militants, by the way. I believe they are the army, similar to the Russian one. This is an army of dictatorial regimes. Without doubt, the Chinese army will act in the same way. Any army of a dictatorial and authoritarian regimes will act like this. Say, 
Army of North Korea breaking through to South Korea will act in the same way, no doubt. And when Russians got away with Bucha, as they believe, because the punishment is slow, although we see the criminal cases, the identified names, but, excuse me, in a country like that, Führer takes responsibility for all decisions, and Putin feels unpunishable. They still shake hands with him from time to time. They get brilliant ideas about making agreements with him. This all brought to the idea that such an ostensible cruelty communicated to the outer world is meant to raise the spirit of their thugs in order to show them that there is nothing to fear and that they are unpunishable. These three factors, impudence, impunity, and readiness to destroy for the sake of destruction, these key features of the Russian army are easily seen in the actions of Hamas. Alexander, so do we see the realization of Russia's plans in this form or another? And in any case, Russian special services worked there. Larissa, I'm saying that what we see is the technology tested in many countries in several conflicts in various forms. And these technologies are clearly used in attacks against Israel. And where there is technology, there must be instructors to teach them. Alexander, what I understood from your words, we can't call the militants on mopeds. They should be regarded as well-trained fighters, and they are not homogeneous. There are specialists and there are marginalized subjects, and each of them plays their own part in this bloody theater. We shouldn't by any means underestimate their combat effectiveness, importance of or power, despite the fact that there might not be many of them, at least not as many as in the full-scale invasion by Russia. Larissa, actually, the number of Hamas, as reported by the Israeli security services, is 40 to 50,000 in Gaza Strip. This is actually a lot for such a small territory. 40 to 50,000 trained military personnel is a lot. And if they mobilize from those 2 million people, the population, that will also be a lot. That's why, yes, they are an army. I will explain why this is important, Sasha. Look, when all of this happened, And the world was shaken. International human rights groups were surprisingly quiet. But when Israel started retaliating and bombed the rich residential quarter, and who lives in the rich residential quarter? The Hamas leaders live there. Immediately, we hear their voices. Amnesty International spoke up today about the violation of rights of the peaceful residents in Gaza Strip, and that's almost a genocide. They were silent when the Israelis were killed. Some say that's because they are leftist. They will support the Palestinians. It's not because of that. The point is that a democratic country abides with the requirements of the international law. It abides with the moral principles. Therefore, it is compelled to act within the established international norms. But such regimes as Putin's, they don't have to. Hamas don't have to. To be frank, Palestine does not exist. All these years, while Israel has been developing... Palestine was not formed as a state. And it is very convenient when terror acts are committed under your orders, real war crimes with hostages, rapes, killings, but as long as you're not a state, you can't be held accountable. If the performer is killed, his family will receive pension for life. So what is happening in the modern world is Cannibals and murderers are looking for opportunities to hide behind something from accountability. So they're looking for opportunities to hide behind from accountability. The likes of Putin are hiding behind a nuclear bomb. 
Some hide behind their money, which is the case in many countries, for instance in Saudi Arabia, Arabia. When the crown prince orders the killing of a journalist in the embassy, sorry, but that is crime. And after a while, the U.S. president shakes hands with him. Everybody is shocked first, but it is clear that he gets away with it. Hollywood films beautiful patriotic humanistic movies funded by the Chinese producers, while Uyghurs are being killed in China. They are being subjected to genocide in China, and nobody is bothered about it about it. And talking about China is bad manners in Hollywood. Thus, dictatorships are hiding behind money and influence, nukes, or behind the absence of state. By the way, Lebanon uses the same excuse of no statehood as well as Iran, Hezbollah, as the army of Iran, which is clear. It's like Wagner but much bigger, with airplanes and tanks and everything they need. And they pretend that they are not Iran, although they are funded by Iran, but no, they are not Iran's. They are on the territory of Lebanon. But no, they are not Lebanese. So interesting. When they commit atrocities, the states which benefit from it can pretend that they have nothing to do with them. We are not there. It's the same technology. This axis of evil is now uniting its resources and capabilities in the fight against humanity, against progress. Alexander, I'd like to talk about the axis of evil. Today, South Korea expressed concern that North Korea can also break through the border and seize part of the territory and take hostages. The world is started to suspect that these are not separate episodes of invasions and aggressions such as against Ukraine or Israel, but these are the tentacles of one octopus. Potential victims are suspecting this. When the full-scale invasion of Ukraine started, Prime Minister of Estonia said if it was Estonia, it wouldn't be able to defend itself. And it was Poland who first revealed the NATO plans to give away the countries and then liberate them. Prime Minister of Estonia said they planned to give us away and then liberate within six months, but nothing would be left of us. After that, after that NATO cancelled that strategy, that concept. Thus, countries closest to Ukraine's were first to speak about it. Now, South Korea. It's logical because the main point is that these are potential victims and they were the first to suspect it. They realized they were the next, that the impossible is possible. And the axis of evil almost knows it for sure that the world is ultimately defenseless. They obviously understand that whatever their proxies are doing, by the way, Putin is rearing Lukashenko for something. The question is why? He's painting him to look like Kim Jong Un. There is a purpose behind it. So everybody understands that the reaction of the world, the reaction of the United States will be weak and delayed. The actions will be reactive rather than proactive. They know that the world is not ready to fight against them. They are openly conducting a well-coordinated hybrid third, third world war and the world is not ready to stand up to them in a consolidated way. Even the situation with Israel, what we observe is the interesting thing. These days, when the whole world is talking about atrocities, the Israeli journalists unanimously say that they saw the same in Bucha. There are a lot of Israeli journalists who say, we went to Kherson.
We saw what was taking place there. I was in Izum, in Bucha, in Kiev. I saw it. It was in Ukraine. They are telling the Israelis that in Ukraine it is like this. But then Bibi Netanyahu comes up today and reads a fairly long address to the nation, and he tells the people of Israel, we are fighting human animals. It is understandable that there is a certain degree of dehumanization involved by comparing the attack to the behavior of animals. And then says, last time we saw it during the Holocaust. And immediately the Israeli journalist said that the last time they saw it was in the Ukrainian Bucha. So what is happening when Bibi Netanyahu calls upon the world to unite against the common threat? He forgets that he should unite with those who are already fighting their battle against the same threat. He, for some reason, forgets to mention the Russian Federation as one of the designations. This is where the essence is. Everyone is ready to fight for themselves and call on the United States as the father to help them, but nobody is ready to unite. In the meantime, South Korea, for example, understands the threat and it has the largest arsenals and it was asked by the United States to help, but it referred to its legislation and said that it cannot help. I'd like to know if the United States was drawn into a war with North Korea to help South Korea, would South Korea's legislation prevent it from helping the United States? I don't think so. Everything would be fine then. So, these potential victims understand that they are terrified, but just turn to the United States. But the United States cannot cover for everybody. And it's a classical Chinese tactic of a thousand cuts. It is obviously a war against the United States. The axis of evil decided to defeat them as the guarantor of prosperity of the collective West, including Europe. If the United States fall, Europe's prosperity will fall too. This is obvious, because nobody can protect them. This is 1,000 cuts against the United States. Alexander, you touched upon the theme of which force is opposing Israel. Let's talk about that force, which is opposing Ukraine. The public in Ukraine is saying that what Israel was experiencing within a few days, both by scale and by the intensity, is not even comparable to what Ukrainians have been experiencing and are experiencing in the last 600 days or so. What do you think? Is it right to compare such things? Israel is confronting a much weaker enemy. And although it's a separate question, but let's compare the combat prowess of Ukraine, which is defending itself against the Russian terrorists and Israeli military personnel defending their country, the Hamas, against the Hamas terrorists, who are essentially the Iranian proxies. Larissa, we don't see Israel's field operations yet. And I don't think it is right to compare the extent of grief. It is wrong to say we suffer more than anyone else. It would certainly be better if we were hurt less. This is some kind of unhealthy narcissism to assert oneself at the expense of pain and wounds. I think that Ukraine is opposing a nuclear power, including Iran, which is an open ally in this war, and Belarus, which provides its territory and special security services, its arsenals, its training grounds, and China is lurking behind all of them. Who is opposing Israel? Today, it started with Hamas, and we know that Hezbollah is ready to jump in. We don't know if Iran will join the war, and it has serious capabilities. Moreover, according to the American intelligence data, Iran is only one week away from the producing from producing nuclear weapons. We don't know how Lebanon will behave. We don't know how Egypt will behave. Israel 
is preparing to enter the Gaza Strip, and it's a rather difficult battle. Will Israel endure war on two fronts? Will the USA help Israel? Yes, they brought in an aircraft carrier. We don't know. There were aircraft carriers for Ukraine looming since 2014, but we didn't see much value in it. We are opposed by the same forces, and behind them stands China. Saudi Arabia concluded agreement with Iran, its enemy, and is not concluding agreement with Israel now, which would signify the total change of politics in the Middle East. This is serious. It means that now China is playing an important role there as an important partner and as a mediator and not the United States. This is also obvious. Therefore, instead of comparing, I will see these processes as one whole. It is also obvious that if anyone, if another conflict flares up somewhere else, and I'm sure it will, it won't be an operation against Hamas. When the Israeli army enters Gaza Strip, it will have a heavy battle on its hands. How many will die? Hamas prepared for it. There are tunnels. We don't know if they will run away to Egypt through tunnels and blow up everything behind them. How many Israeli military personnel will be left? We can't say. And will they be able to withstand a simultaneous attack from Hezbollah? And what if proper armies join the war after the proxy armies like Wagner? Which will do the attrition part and leave the rest to the armies of the states, one of which can become a nuclear power by then? I am somewhat stunned by amazing day-to-day -day analysis. I think we have been witnessing interesting processes for decades and conclusions should be made within that kind of time frame. Bibi Netanyahu, wearing a St. George's ribbon, standing next to Putin, faced consequences of that gesture, which manifested today. When we say, how could Sahal and Mossad miss the attack? They didn't miss anything. It's just that Bibi Netanyahu wanted to be friends with Putin, who, like Zelensky, thought that readiness not to provoke, not to escalate, would guarantee success. Just hours before the attack, Hamas and Israel signed some agreements where Israel increased the amount of payments and perks to Hamas. But destruction was more important for Hamas. By the way, the leader of Hezbollah threatened the United States and said, Gaza is not Ukraine for you. What he meant was they would carry out terrorist attacks on the territory of the United States. It threatened the United States and was talking to the U.S. president. So we don't know their plans, but they have certain plans. Clearly they do. And behind all of that stands China and Russia as its proxy. Alexander. Why did the USA bring their aircraft carrier there? Why didn't USA and NATO enter the Black Sea despite constant attack of Ukraine from the Black Sea and destruction of the ports, granaries, grain storage facilities with grain needed to feed the significant part of the humanity? I understand what you're saying. Let's see how the USA will handle the situation in Israel. However, in case of Ukraine, they didn't do even that. Larissa, I assure you, they will not do it for Israel either, because when we draw comparisons with the doomsday operation, the similarity is not the day of the week when the attack was carried out. But similarity is in that the USA were busy with the Watergate scandal. And they could not and didn't want to openly help Israel with weapons. They pretended they were playing with the the mediator role, but seeing how Israel was struggling, they sent them an airplane with weapons under the cover of the night. The airplane was spotted, and the Arab countries 
weaponized oil and fuel prices increased four times. That was the similarity. I'm sure that if Israel, after drawing itself into the war, finds itself in a difficult situation, I assure you that not a single pair of American boots will step on the Israeli soil. I don't think the USA will help with aviation because China will emerge instantly with its nuclear threat. You see how convenient. Ayatollahs are a step away from the nuclear bomb, after which they can attack Israel when it is exhausted from wars with Hamas and Hezbollah. But we don't know. The process hasn't completed yet. What if it flares up around North Korea and China and Taiwan? It's not time for sulking. It's time for consolidating. The free world is under a consolidated attack and should consolidate and repel it together. By the way, it's Russia's full flag narrative, false flag narrative about Hamas having Ukrainian weapons to say that Ukrainians sold ammunition and weapons to Hamas in a Turkish bazaar. For example, the Syrian media widely disseminated footage of Bashar Assad on a Ukrainian military truck, meaning that Ukraine is selling weapons, which it receives from the West. And it was investigated and fact-checked and established that it was a fake. It wasn't a Ukrainian car. Just imagine, the attack against Israel is imminent. Bashar Assad is not doing well. The Russian army is tied up and choking in its own blood. But there are people sitting in garages and working on creating a Ukrainian fake to take some pictures. And after the attack on Israel, immediately we hear a lot of people saying that weapons are from Ukraine. We are witnesses of these synchronized events. Meanwhile, in the West, there are many people who are doing everything possible to communicate that Ukraine and Israel have a common enemy and countries should unite in the face of the common enemy. I read your article about the axis of good, but we call it the axis of stability versus the axis of chaos because the enemy's strategy is the creation of chaos and uncertainty in various parts of the world. And this axis of stability should include the USA, Ukraine, Israel, for sure. Axis of stability and certainty does not mean that we have differences with the axis of uncertainty. No, it means that we know who we are, what we do, and what our goals are, and we will achieve them. Currently, we have chaos and uncertainty. The USA can't figure out the aims of the war. Bibi can't figure out the place of Putin in the cosmos, etc. Total uncertainty. Thus, when we determine our goals, then the axis of, axis of evil will not have a chance. However, it looks like we can hardly determine all about us in the situation in view of the number of actors and interested parties. Alexander, so you don't believe that the USA will define their goals in the short run, as well as Europe, Japan, all enlightened forces of the world must define their common goals. Your forecast is not optimistic. Larissa, no, I don't believe it is possible. Within the democratic states, and Putin knows it and takes advantage of it, for the hybrid wars, whereby democracy is used against itself, different in influence groups, different points create imbalance. The propaganda in the West is based on freedom of speech and on the diversity of opinions and Kremlin uses it to create a chaos. For instance, Israel unites to fight. All talks and quarrels are put aside, religious and secular groups, right and left, everybody is united in war. In Ukraine we had some, something similar. How can a free speech America unite and say Trump is destroying our country? That shutdown was an attempt to fell America. The photo of Elon Musk with a machine gun, a person who knows nothing about weapons, narratives about standing up for their choice. 
what are these narratives about? Are they about an armed unrest against the backdrop of elections? In order to stop all of that chaos in the society ruffled up by subversive agents of influence and local useful idiots. Just to announce that the country is at war, but people will be surprised. How do you explain the Americans that they are already at war? And how do you explain it to the Germans or the French? Europe was shocked to see pro-Palestinian protests. And they don't understand that maybe they missed something. Maybe Palestinians need more money. Let's give them more money. Twice more multiculturalism. This is war. And the war is not with Putin or Xi. Any world war is a reaction to unresolved conflicts and controversies. The World War I was for equality, and the result of the war was a series of revolutions and coup d'etat. And although the Charter of Human Rights was adopted, there were inequalities within societies where people didn't want to continue living in working barracks and working in the mines where their children started working from five years old for the same employers and all of that squalor next to the gilded toilets. The war started as an aristocratic entertainment. The participants didn't clearly understand why they joined it. Why did all those kings and dukes start it? But when masses joined it, it brought to the battle for equality, to the series of coup d'etat, very bloody. But it started with jolly moods, of the kings and dukes announcing wars and their dames adoring them, followed by four years of blood and death in the trenches and questions. What did the soldiers die for? World War Two was a response to the World War I, an attempt of revenge that all people were equal, but the Germans were more equal than others, and Jews, Roma and others were unnecessary. Hitler had ideas of his own, but World War II resulted in anti-colonialism because a series of colonial regimes fell, and what appeared in their place was even worse, much worse than the order established in the colonies. And now, some dictators want their own rules to have zones of influence. They want to rule. What did Putin say? Just like all other revanchists, revenge seekers, like in other wars, remember what happened with those elites who started the wars, they perished along with the soldiers in the trenches. What Putin says, we want bipolar world, zones of influence, our own rules. But the unfolding war is a war for humanity, because we don't understand who are humans. And who are human animals, as Bibi Netanyahu put it, who you can read Dostoevsky or Schopenhauer. You may speak several languages, but when you witness killings of humans just for fun and you decide to take their side because you decided that you are a Muslim, you're an Arab, you're against America, you stop being a human. When you turn away from those murdered in Bucha, and when you consider territorial issues, after knowing that in Kherson there were torture chambers for children, and these are not Ukrainian narratives, but international investigations, which determined that children were tortured in Kherson, and after that some scumbag comes up, someone like Kissinger, a person with a reputation, someone who thinks of himself as a good person, and says... Let's exchange this territory of Ukraine to Ukraine's NATO membership. Let's make it beautiful. And there are no torture chambers, no butchers, where respectable people, just like the Hollywood stars who take money from China. Everything is fine. This war will be for humanity, because nothing is left. No religion, no states, no culture, no social groups. You're either a human and you do not accept it. You say, stop it. For the sake of Islam, 
for the sake of Russia, for the sake of humanism, you say stop. Because Islam cannot be this. Prophet Muhammad never wanted this. How can this be Islam? How can this be Russia? What is unfolding is a different situation. People drawn into the funnel of this war are not ready to define what it means to be a human and what it means to be inhuman. And this is what this war is about. And it will seize the whole world, Alexander. Yes, it is seizing the whole world already. I write and talk exactly like you. The West and its partners should switch their economies to wartime mode. We are still far from that. Some of them started to understand, trying to produce more ammunition, but it is still nothing compared to Russia, which is producing 2 million shells per year, twice more than all NATO countries together, while NATO thinks it will produce 1 million per year after two years. Germany has a prohibition on the production of tanks. They have a law that they may not produce more than 250 tanks, and some of them are even out of order. The previous Minister of Defense prohibited to audit tanks for fear of sending them to Ukraine. They think that, yes, there are some warm and hot spots here and there, but nothing to worry about. What they worry about is the slowdown of the economy, budgets, social issues, while a sword of Damocles is hanging over it and can wipe it out from the face of the earth. Larissa, yes, and faster than the West thinks, because complacency was pardonable during World War I and World War II when information did not travel so fast and was not in the open. And when you see all that, you can't pretend that it's none of your business. When Chamberlain said, I brought you peace, he might have not known what was going on in Germany, but the masses whom he brought peace definitely did not know. And now everybody knows everything. And when they pretend that they don't see, and it's not important, the Western society becomes demoralized and destroyed from its value-based foundations. In the past, people could say they didn't know and could hardly believe that Germany was killing the Jews. Why didn't we, being a good America, give them visas to save them while it was possible in order to rescue Freud? His client paid a bribe to the Nazi. Now, nobody can pretend, and now it's more difficult to justify why 0.5% of the economy is more important than people. This will change the foundations of the Western world, and it will fall. The fall will not, will not look like Russian army in Paris. No, first Paris will fall, and then the Russian army will come.